I've got trust issues. It's like you can't go a single day without hearing another tech privacy scandal. Or maybe that's just my algorithm. What's that? Microsoft Edge caught leaking all of your search history to Bing AI? Security camera footage from inside your home was given to police without a warrant? Toyota's been exposing the location data of over 2 million cars for the last 10 years without anybody noticing? Of course they have. Why would you think you're entitled to privacy? You stupid idiot. Mass data harvesting, dark patterns, predatory business practices. And like, at what point did our data become the new oil? Is it our fault for buying into the hype and believing this nonsense? Terms and conditions, I'm not reading that. Some people just believe privacy is a myth. But those with nothing to hide have nothing to fear, right? Is this even any different than how it's always been? Oh look, people are peopling again. Does any of this even matter? Only when you get scammed. Welcome to the Daily Mind Trap, where my hope is that collectively we can learn about our world, develop self-awareness, and maybe even find comfort in chaos. Today I'm wondering why every day seems like I'm in the front seat of a rogue driving Tesla hurtling at top speed towards a dystopian nightmare that is our technological future. And why I'm a bit hesitant. If you're new here, thank you for stopping by. Please subscribe and show some love if you want to see more from me. If you haven't already escaped to the woods to grow organic vegetables, then you've probably heard of the Internet of Things. The S stands for security. See, because technology is getting cheaper and more advanced, it's now possible to connect almost anything to a Wi-Fi network. Think about how you could rig up your house with multiple security cameras, sensors, and window contact alarms that all feed into a smartphone app. This app then sends real-time alerts and info to not just your smartphone, but also your smartwatch, iPad, computer, emails, whatever, and can be controlled via voice commands or logged into via biometric software that scans your face. Not only is technology getting better at giving us seamless experiences between the digital and physical worlds, but this is also the kind of multifunctionality that many of us have come to expect from the digital products that we purchase. If I'm looking to buy a new washing machine, well, damn it, I need that washing machine to fit into my workflow. Every technological device or app promises to make us fitter, happier, or more productive. And we lap it up. Productivity hack, answer work emails while you're pooping. Ever have what you thought was a fab idea for an invention, only to say it out loud and realize nobody really needs that? Well, just imagine if you connected that invention to the internet. A Fitbit for your overweight dog. A smart hairbrush that listens to your hair to see if you're brushing it wrong. Dental floss so you can track how little you've been flossing. Luggage that weighs itself. Actually, that sounds pretty handy. How much is it? Cabin luggage, 22 inch is $784. Check-in, $916 Australian. Oh, but it charges your smartphone too. Well, in that case, bargain. A $100 toaster that sends you a notification when your toast is done. And they also sell a smart mirror that shows you the notification from the toaster. Not every idea is a winner, you know. Anyway, aside from the obvious question, what's the point? One of the biggest concerns about connecting everything, including your toilet paper to the internet, is to do with what data these devices are collecting, where they're sending it, how it's being used, and what it's saying about us. The proliferation of IoT devices raises real concerns about data security, privacy, and the potential for unauthorized access or misuse of personal information. It's no secret that big companies like Meta and Google are making bank off our personal data. But if you're like me, you might have never taken the time to Google what personal data is Google collecting every time I search on Google. Turns out a lot of our personal information is exposed every time we visit a web page send an email or enter that Facebook competition to win a new coffee machine. Out of all the major tech companies guilty of harvesting our data, by far the biggest offender is Google. Not surprising as their literal business model is reliant on having as much data as possible about everything and providing super streamlined access to users. Google keeps a buttload of data on you, me, and the whole world. If it's data, then there's a good chance that Google is collecting it. Yeah, just
lessons, application, crash reports, investigations, sets it out of cell towers, being in DBS location, SMS, text, conversations, records, something called duration, papers, lessons, my device, terms, of your communication, likes and shares, online engagements, your political involvement, slur donations, destinations, in the world, your advertisement, likes and less than room, number device, and social media, email address, and cloud access, and passwords that you can't build, what's in your weekly groceries, the status of your ovaries, digitize and analyze your data, sold to third parties, smart work, shadow aggregations, get some digit saturation, easy hacking, nerve wracking, perfectly there's regulation, emails, cut and then compose, all your mix and videos, your spreadsheets, but just seats, dependence that are self imposed, down with your own opposition, support your privacy politicians, ethical application installation, and please read the terms and conditions. Holy shit balls! that's a lot of stuff. What do they do with all that data though? Does it all just go to targeted advertising? Our online data is worth a lot of money. The people who are in the position to make the most from our data are search engines, online marketing platforms like Facebook. Did you know that Facebook is called an online marketing platform? And data brokers. A data broker is an organization that collects and sells data. The most pertinent point for us is that they gather data about people, you and me, and sell it to marketers so they can make awesome customer informed ads like this. Russo's P Less is made in Australia and comes with a money back guarantee. The real big boys of data harvesting are huge corporations like Axiom, Epsilon, and Experian. But there are around 4,000 data brokers in the world. In 2022, the industry was worth $274 billion. Which, for comparison, in 2022, the global market size of video games was around $200 billion US. And rice was worth around $292 billion globally. This market growth is due to the exponential increase in data generation, attributed mainly to IoT devices and web scraping tools. Data brokers do their dirty work in a few different ways. Wherever you live, your government is collecting data about you. Some of this information is public, so data brokers go around collecting census data, court records, and so on. A person generates about 1.7 megabytes of data about them every day. A lot of it is on social media, open for public consumption because we all crave validation from our friends. So the brokers take that data from Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and other platforms. Data brokers can purchase consumer data from your internet provider, your credit card company, any loyalty cards you have with retailers, free-to-play apps, dating profiles, pretty much anything you sign your data away to has the potential to be bought by a broker. Data brokers who are able to successfully sell your data in prepackaged consumer bundles will be making the most bucks. Combining your name, age, gender, ethnicity, email address, phone number, how much money you make, your shopping habits, political preferences, your social cultural beliefs, where you live, your daily routine, what porn you jerk off to, or your deepest, darkest secrets, you get the point. Today, depending on the industry, your email address alone might be worth from $84 to $251 US. But that's not all. Data brokers sell your geolocation, extremely accurate location data that, for example, would allow somebody to see almost exactly where you are at any point in time. Wired published an article in 2021 where they report that LexisNexis, LexisNexis? Jeez. Where LexisNexis advertises the ability to determine a person's current whereabouts using recent driver license records. Experian outright advertises mobile location data. Oracle advertises marketing services based on a user's real-time location. And Blue Dot claimed to track the number of times an individual visited a location and how long they were there for. As you can imagine, data brokers are extremely reluctant to share what apps and companies they buy your location data from. But if you'd like to know which apps collect and store the most location data from users. The top contenders include Snapchat, Apple, Instagram, DoorDash, and Depop. On the civil rights front, federal agencies from the FBI to US Immigration and Customs Enforcement purchase data from data brokers without warrants, public discourses, or robust oversight to carry out everything from criminal investigations to deportations. What this means is that the rules that ordinarily keep your mobile phone company from giving your data to the FBI can be bypassed if Telstra first sells your data to a data broker, who then sells your data to law enforcement. Then, because this data was purchased through a broker, the FBI can use it without the normal legal restrictions applying. Because even though the data is based on, say, US individuals, the laws don't apply to open source or commercially obtained data. In this context, real-time location data poses a real opportunity for abuse, particularly where law enforcement are conducting operations against individuals or groups from historically marginalized communities. In August 2020, four members of Congress penned a letter to the firm Mobile Waller for just this reason. After the company advertised that it identified characteristics of Black Lives Matter protesters by using their phone's location data. And data brokers aren't exactly known for their ethical handling of sensitive information either. Back in 2013, one company got into trouble for selling lists of real people who had been sexually assaulted, as well as alcoholics and people with HIV AIDS. 
wait a minute. Is this even legal? There's got to be some laws or something that protect us, right? Well, the good news is that data brokering is legal just about everywhere. Shit, wait, no. No, the good news is that thanks to major privacy fuck-ups, like from Facebook in 2019, as well as whistleblowers and privacy advocates, there are now laws that help regulate how companies gather data, what types of data they can collect, and what can be done with it. One major example is the European General Data Protection Regulation, the GDPR. In Australia, we also have the Privacy Act 1988. And in the US, well, you guys get this cluster muck of acronyms. HIPAA, FICRA, FERPA, GLERPA, ECRA, COPPA, FERPA, and unfortunately don't have a singular law that covers the privacy of all types of data. In 2018, however, California adopted one of the toughest privacy laws of any state with the Consumer Privacy Act. It introduced new obligations for businesses to disclose information about data collection and protection for consumers that include a right to delete personal information and a right to opt out of having their information sold. But of course, regulation doesn't stop data brokers from brokering because money. As an individual, you can look at delisting and opting out of databases, but there are a lot of them and it's a lengthy process. Delete Me and Privacy Duck both offer services that will keep you off data broker databases, but you'll have to pay. If like me, you're interested in starting the process, then I'll put some links in the comments for some great resources that I've found. Well, that's it. I'm done. This is too much for me. I don't want to be a part of this world anymore. Look, it's all about striking a balance between privacy and convenience. How much you're willing to risk versus how much you need to access these services. Many IoT devices serve important functions that aid people with disabilities and improved connectivity can help ordinary people in lots of ways. So it's not about throwing all of your shit away and never connecting to the internet again. Really, you need to think about how much you need to access these types of services yourself, how they aid in your life and what you're willing to risk in order to use them. Not all companies, not all software, not all devices are trustworthy. And it's our responsibility to do the work. Or if you're lucky, there'll be amazing people who do that legwork for you. And I'll absolutely put some links in the comments below for you to check out. And remember, just because you're connected with Google doesn't mean that there aren't some excellent alternatives that you just haven't heard about. Don't think that just because you're already within a certain technological ecosystem, that there isn't room for you to regain some of that privacy back. Just remember that when they say that something is free, it's most likely that you're the product. All right, I'm gonna leave it there for today. If that didn't scare the pants off you, then I'm sorry, I'll try harder next time. I'm planning at least another four videos on privacy and technology, so please subscribe if you're interested in that. As always, if you'd like to continue the discussion in the comments with me, my question for you today is, do you think that companies should be allowed to profit off your personal data? Do you care what data is collected about you or are you just a super chill, easy going dude? Thank you so much for watching and a huge shout out to my five Patreons for making this video possible. I'll see you in the next one. This app then smells, smells.